At this time of year, the chances are slim, as the trout are dormant and tend not to bite. Adam and Jason have got a better chance with the ptarmigan, which live right around the world at these northern latitudes. If you watch ptarmigan, you'll see that they like to feed on the buds of birch trees like this. And they tend to make their way across the hillsides in sunshine. So what we do is we present them with a little fence full of the food that they need, the buds like this. What I'm going to try to do here is uh, set a ptarmigan snare. I've selected my area. There's uh, some tracks running across, uh, traversing across this hillside here. To make the snare, I've taken this forked branch like this, and at the ends, I'm going to br break the sapling like that, not so it snaps off, just so it's a green stick fracture. And this, when I push it into the snow, will set an anchor in place. Now, in true survival fashion, we've been rummaging around in the soldiers' rucksacks to see what we could find to make a snare from. And what we've come up with is this, which is, believe it or not, the guidance cable for a guided missile. I've never used that before. I can't see the end. Well, I've secured my snare off using this bit of wire, tied it off to a reasonably strong branch. You see the snare there against, against my hand. Fence further on, and so on. And the thing with the snares is you want to check them on a fairly regular basis, so either at the end of the day or at the uh, beginning of the day. And more importantly, remember where you've put them, because if you look at the landscape behind me, yeah, you'll stick them anywhere, and you'll soon forget exactly where you've put them. Okay, Preben, tell us how the fishing went today. Uh, fishing was not very productive today. Um, we made a lot of holes uh, at the ice in different areas, uh, tried to find where the trout is supposed to uh, gather. But uh, either we didn't find the right spot, uh, there's not a lot of trout, or uh, it's too probably too early at the year, so it's too dark yet. So tomorrow we try another another lake with a with a different kind of fishing supposed to eat more this time of year. The one thing our team doesn't have to contend with is bad weather. Sixty years ago, the winter was one of the worst on record. By contrast, we couldn't be luckier. Well, we're blessed with another beautiful morning. About to go searching for our grouse team. I thought you might like, though, to see the sort of logistical support it takes to keep a film crew on the road in these conditions. It's a lot more than grouse ever had. We're very lucky, we've got the Norwegian army providing this support, and here you can see their band wagons, their BVs, which can go more or less anywhere. And in there we've got fuel, food, generators, the whole works. Over here, this is their ski pit, to keep their skis safe from bad weather, so they don't blow away or get broken in storms. And they're sleeping in this eight-man tent, which is actually more cosy than the cabin. And that's because, you see that, that canister there, that's diesel fuel that feeds into a stove that keeps this warm all through the night. This is the inside of the tent, it's really hot in here. This sleeps eight to ten people, and they lie with their feet all pointing towards this, the stove on which you can cook and heat the tent. Organisation is always the key in these situations. On the left-hand side of the tent, there's garbage, and that's where fuel feeds in. On the right-hand side is the clean side for food and water. And as always, down here, there's a cold well. After six days on the plateau, Jason and Adam are reduced to scouring the area for edible vegetation. By December 1942, the original grouse team had been on the ground for six weeks, and their meagre diet had left them with all the symptoms of severe vitamin deficiency. We had so much water in our bodies. And I can tell you that my neck was so sick that I could not get this to. So we understand that we needed vitamins. 
The winter vegetation of the plateau would keep them alive for only so long. They also needed a reliable source of protein. Interestingly, they never even tried fishing, and Preben and Thomas are about to find out why. Through trial and error, their search for a suitable lake will take them on a round trip of over 20 kilometers. The further they go, the more energy they use, and the more fish they'll have to catch to make the whole trip worthwhile. To the unprepared, this place would be a death trap. But if you're comfortable in this sort of environment, it's the most amazing place to test your skills. Uh -huh. What we got here, see where that's sheared? That broke off, I didn't saw it there. That's broken off there, because we've got two different layers of snow. Quite interesting to see that. Yeah. Two different layers of snow, and one slid right off of the other. That's exactly why avalanches happen. The snow gets disturbed, it slides off. This snow hole is hard work, taking most of the day to dig out. It takes really severe conditions to create drifts this deep. But if the weather turns against you, this shelter is stronger than a tent. I've dug it into about a metre and a half depth, and now I can start to make the sleeping platforms, which are raised so that there'll be a cold well for the cold air to sink away from where we're sleeping. Once you've filled in all the gaps in the roof, you need to make sure you can still get fresh air. First, a ventilation hole. Then, an early warning system. If the candle goes out, it's because it can't get enough oxygen. Without the candle, it might be you that sputters and dies. Meanwhile, Preben's luck is about to change. Come in. Come here. Yeah! Oh, four centimeters from here. I love you, baby. I feel a bit sorry for you as well, though. But uh, on the other hand, you yeah. don't. You don't. You're starving. So I hope you can have like uh, 15 more of you. That would be nice. Success. But they've covered 22 kilometers each. This is all they have to show for it, and the trout will have to be split four ways. Clearly, it's not a worthwhile return for the energy needed to catch it. There you go. Good enough. Luckily, the crew and I are living by different rules. Just as well, as each evening there are eight hungry mouths to feed, and no one feels like catching and cooking their own meal. These are the rations we've been living on. These are Norwegian army rations. They split into three sections, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, all you have to do is add hot water. It's excellent. So when you go out for the day, you just take that and a thermos of hot water. A day's rations provides about 5,000 calories, which sounds a lot, but you burn up far more than usual just staying warm in this environment. Five kilometers away, our grouse team is sharing a single trout. Just 300 calories, split four ways. It's their only meal of the day, so every morsel counts. We are standing out on the ice and freezing, and use a lot of energy to make these holes. And if you get some fish, the fish are slim. So not really good for a, for a body. So you think we should forget the fishing? I think we should do that. And uh, try uh, other things. Next morning, and the lack of food is starting to get to the grouse team. Oh, we got reindeer moss this morning. Oh, I love it. Do you? Yes. Is it nice? This is a um, reindeer moss.